about 85%. The, the tip of a block has eight uh, uh, on-street spaces, so one of them is open. The other seven are occupied. The important thing is that we want to have the spaces well used, being they're almost fully occupied and not quite. Uh, so they're well used, uh, but they're readily available. Uh, and then nobody can say that, that there's shortage of, of parking. They'll see convenient parking everywhere. Uh, and I think that's very important. When you're going to a city, uh, when you're going out for dinner, or, let's say you're, uh, yes, yeah, two or three people in the car and going out for dinner, uh, the, the worst thing that, that can happen to you guys is to have no parking at all. So I think that, uh, that uh, rather, I think having a, a space available at the right price is a lot better than having no spaces available. Well, um, some cities are beginning to do this. San Francisco got a grant from the federal government to try it out. It's a pilot program so that other cities can copy it if they like the results. Uh, and they have, have a graphic artist to show well, what is the parking problem. Well, suppose there's one block, the top block is crowded. Uh, people say there's no place to park. And some other blocks may be far away, less convenient. Uh, the, uh, they have uh, empty spaces. Uh, so the solution is you nudge up the price on the top block and nudge it down on the bottom block so you move one car from the top block to the bottom block and this is what you get. And I don't think you could do a better job of managing parking than if every block looked like one of these two blocks. So, now some people think, oh, this is a wrenching social change to charge for parking and vary prices. Is that we can't do this. It's, a, it's, a, it's like prohibition or the reformation. You know, we're not capable of this. But if you can't move one car from a crowded street to an uncrowded street, what can you do? I mean, has America lost its capacity to, 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 to do the right things? Um, uh, I think it's really a small change I'm asking for. And uh, San Francisco also had uh, the money to do with graphics. Uh, a, a short video uh, to explain how it works. And I think in less than three minutes it explains everything that I'm taking an hour to say. Here, here is uh, their version of it. Finding a parking space can be frustrating and time consuming. It's estimated close to a third of city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for a space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. These cars slow down public transit and get in the way of emergency vehicles. And drivers focused on finding parking create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. SF Park's goal is to have at least one parking space available per block. That way drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steadier flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. Newly installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability and rates online, by text message, and by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help people decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF park meters will make pay easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SF MTA parking cards. Parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to meter parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand, once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So, in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are plentiful, Rates will decrease until most of the empty space is filled, or until rates bottom up at as little as 25 cents per hour. SF Park is designed to ensure that drivers easily find an open space near their destination. SF Park will help people plan ahead. Well, 
it's been operating for more than uh, two years now, and the price has never changed by more than 25 cents an hour, it's usually uh, every six weeks or so. And they just look at the, uh, the uh, occupancy during the previous six weeks and say, well, is the price right? And we'll leave it the way it is, or is it too low or too high? So here are two parallel blocks, which uh, the results surprised me uh, enormously. <coughs> they were both uh, $2 an hour at the start of the program. You start with the price you already have and just measure, look at it, and look at it. That's the most important thing to do with parking, is look at it. And the lower street, uh, Lombard, was under-occupied. These are five blocks of two parallel streets. They're just one block apart. And you can see that the uh, price started out two dollars an hour. It was, uh, and some of the blocks were, were under uh, under occupied, so they began reducing the price. And it was still quite low. Some blocks were uh, under occupied. Finally, it got down to a dollar an hour, and then it moved right into the range where they wanted it to be. And this top street, which was a more popular area with nicer stores and things like that, it was two dollars an hour. It was more occupied, above eighty-five percent. So they kept nudging the price up, and finally it got here. They actually crossed. So you can't say that people don't respond to prices uh, because it's a very, very gradual price changes. It, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, uh, it's taking patience and many small price changes to achieve the desired outcome. Uh, and this trend is happening throughout the, uh, the whole city. Uh, here you can say that the green line is a percentage of spaces that are in the desired uh, occupancy range. And I guess the red spaces are over-occupied, and the, uh, the blue spaces are under-occupied. Uh, so it's moving in the right direction. People thought that, no, people won't pay any attention to prices. Uh, but and many people won't. Most people won't. But enough people do that you move a few people from the overcrowded streets to the undercrowded streets, you get what you want. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, here's just uh, these two blocks of Lombard and um, uh, of Chestnut uh, in, in San Francisco. And you can see that there are astonishing price differences. That, uh, uh, some of the prices went down to, oops, went down to um, uh, uh, 50 cents an hour. And around the corner it's 450. How could that happen? Well, a journalist would call me and ask me, well, what does this do with all I sort of fumbled for a response and I said, well, if, if a block is always half empty, you know, like this, don't you think the city should reduce the price of parking? Well, of course, everybody can see that. Well, then if all the spaces are full all the time, should they go to the price now? Well, that follows as well. And if that's what it takes to get these two blocks in the, in the right range, so what? It's a big surprise. I think that there, maybe there are a lot of tourists who don't know that the prices vary from block to block, and they're just so happy to find the space. Um, but the sa savvy motorists, or the, the residents who, who know what's happening, they will choose the, the cheaper spaces, uh, I think. Um, and so, some people think, think that, well, this is not really fair to, uh, to let the law of supply and demand uh, 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 determine the price of poverty. What does hurt poor people? Well, if you were a poor person, if you were short of money, and you wanted to park in this area, would you rather have the old system where it's $2 on every block? Or would you like to have the new system? Whereas if you're willing to walk two or three blocks, you could pay 50 cents an hour. So I think that people who are short of money would say, I see what you mean. This means if I'm willing to walk for a few blocks, I can get a good bargain. And uh, so there are people, especially in San Francisco, who have plenty of money, and they just want to park right in front of where they want to be. And so they're better off, too. So who's worse off as a result of this? Uh, and the, the actual uh, average price of meters actually declined with SF Park. They turned three different price buckets, they call it. There's a price range. Price uh, bucket would be uh, up until noon, and then from noon to 3, and then after 3 p.m. And most of the spaces had been overpriced in the morning. So prices in the morning almost everywhere fell. Some to 25 cents an hour. 
um, uh, the, uh, only nine of the blocks in the whole city had gotten up to six dollars an hour, and 179 had fallen to 25 cents an hour. So it, it, it had a very different uh, outcome that many people just assumed, including me, I think I have to admit. Uh, now, the, before it started, there was opposition to it. Um, uh, they didn't realize that box, many blocks were overpriced uh, uh, and or that park, parking should be free if many spaces are, 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 are open when the price is zero. The right price of much, much parking is zero if, there, if it doesn't cost a short. Um, the, it will only agree to higher prices if all the spaces are occupied before you begin and there is a parking. Well, there was some opposition uh, that there were uh, posters that were put under people's windshields. There's a, a group called the Answer Coalition that act now to stop all the injuries of racism. Everybody would like to see both of those things. But they were saying, this is going to be hurt, hurt poor people, and there's a tax on small businesses, and, you know, generic complaints. Uh, and of course, on the other side, it's in Spanish, it's even, it's even more threatening with all the exclamation points. <laughs> uh, but ANSWER uh, wants uh, no wars for foreign oil, but they want free parking at home, and they don't see any inconsistency between them. Well, 30% of the households in San Francisco do not own a car, so it's hard to say that SM Park or, or any parking charges are going to hurt most poor people. Uh, because most of them can't afford a car. And, and all of the media revenue in San Francisco goes to pay for public transit, which is used by uh, low-income people. And uh, when, if, you, if you're ever on a bus in San Francisco, or LA, or maybe here, uh, you, you know it's often crawling along in congested traffic. And when I look out the window, I see a lot of richer drivers hunting for curb parking. So the buses are crawling along in, in, in buses, um, which are slowed down by richer drivers hunting for uh, underpriced curb parking. So I think policies that subsidize cars over the alternatives are not a good way to help poor people. Um, uh, the, the free curb parking reduces public revenues and therefore public services. And poor people are less able to buy private services to replace public services. Cities have a limited amount of money to help poor people. Uh, is subsidized parking for everyone the best way to spend this money when many poor people can't afford to own a car? Uh, so I think if you have a limited amount of money to spend, uh, uh, spending it on a free parking for everyone is a bad idea. Well, there's... Um, uh, I think the Answer Coalition uh, came around after they saw how it was working. Well, some people think that this is uh, too hard to do. I mean, how can you have prices that vary by time of day, and, uh, day of the week, uh, month of the year? Um, uh, because most people think the parking meters, like the ones you have on your streets, are like identical to the first parking meter installed in the United States in 1935. And here it is. It, it, it functionally is it's identical to the parking meters you have on Atlantic Avenue. Is that you put your money in the meter and you hope to come back before your time runs out. I mean, that's why the original car, uh, parking meters were called an infernal combination of a slot machine and an alarm clock. <laughs> and you just hope you didn't get a ticket. And that's it. Most people don't know how sophisticated modern uh, meters are. Most of them, I'm sorry to say, are imported from abroad. We led the world. We invented the parking meter. Uh, but most of the subsequent advances have occurred outside the United States because we're one of the last co countries that has so much free parking. We have so much parking. We have this miraculous uh, uh, case that there's so much of it. It's, most of it is free. Uh, but the new meters are much more uh, uh, sophisticated. Here's one on the UCLA campus. They can charge different prices at different times of day. You change the prices remotely. You don't have to touch the meter to change the prices. They provide all kinds of statistics to the, uh, to the operators. They can look at the occupants.
occupancy rate by time of day and the payment rate. They can uh, speak to the uh, uh, text in various languages. Um, they can accept credit cards and debit cards. Here's the one on the UCLA campus. It doesn't tell you what the price is until you touch any button on the meter, and it tells you the price at that time. You can see probably the reflection of me in the <laughs> taking a picture of it. And at that time, it was three dollars for the first hour and four dollars uh, for the uh, second hour. Um, well, uh, some of you probably think that professors have a lot of spare time on their hands, so there's some truth to that. I set up my tripod across from one of these. Uh, multi-space speeders and took pictures every four minutes for an hour saying, well, how does this manage the parking demand on this block? Does it do it what I say that it should? Is that the right price at this time? Is this the lowest price the campus could charge and still have one or two open spaces? So I started, you'll see the shadows move as I took a, a, a picture every four minutes. The two the cars on the end never moved. But the, all the others did. Here's four minutes later, you see cars coming and going. Once there was, uh, they were all full. Often there was uh, one or, once there was even three spaces available. But that was quickly filled up. Um, so you see, I think that's what it ought to look like. And whatever city you're in, when you look at a busy a block downtown. Does the parking work as well as that in your downtown? Are the customers being as well served as that? Are the restaurants getting customers like that? That the you know, spaces are well used, they're all well occupied, uh, but they're readily available. So nobody can say, oh, nobody goes downtown Delray anymore because the, 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 there's no parking or <laughs> it's too crowded. So I did a bar chart, of course, to show why there's an academic. Saying that what is the, the percentage of the time that there was one open space? It was most of the time. Sometimes there was one open space, or two or three or none. That's probably as good as you're going to get, given the varying demand for, 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 for a park that's unpredictable. But if, the, if one block is full and there's a one or two open spaces on the next block, that's okay. I'm not saying every block has to one, have one open space all the time, but within two or three blocks, you should be able to see one or two open spaces. Well, is this the right price? Is three dollars uh, uh, an hour uh, for the first hour, four hours for the second hour? Is that the right price here? Well, should it be higher? Well, if it were higher, then you would have uh, too many vacancies. That the spaces wouldn't be used by students who are visiting the library or uh, coming to campus for a short time. That would be the prime spaces right in the middle of campus. Should it be lower? It used to be lower. And there was never a vacant space available when you drove. There would be lines of cars waiting, hoping to see a car going out. I had a student arrive in my office in tears because she had been waiting for a space and some guy zoomed in ahead of her and took it when it came. Uh, so it, it's aggravating when there's no uh, parking. So I think it's just the gold big ox principle of parking prices. Not too high, not too low, but just right. It's also like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. <laughs> the only way you can tell when the price is right is to look at the results. If the results look right, then the price is right. If the results are not right, the price is wrong. Now, uh, one of the reasons I got uh, uh, interested in this is because the wrong prices can do a lot of harm. And that is when the price is too low uh, for curb parking and, and people are driving around hunting for a space. You've probably all done it sometime, maybe even tonight. Uh, I've been speaking to New York and I took pictures of the, the, the price of curb parking. Uh, uh, Outside the hotel, and in a garage, when you add the tax on park, it's twenty dollars for the first hour. For the curb, it's uh, it's a, a dollar uh, for the first hour. And so you drivers compare the cost of uh, off street parking to the price of curb parking, and decide, well, should I drive around a few blocks hoping to see something go out? And then you could earn nineteen dollars <laughs> for a few minutes of cruising. Uh, that's a, that's a, a good idea. I'll give it a try anyway. And of course, Manhattan is so congested, there are so many pedestrians, the case is not a lot of Well, I was uh, speaking in, in Miami uh, uh, earlier this week, and I uh, looked at parking uh, prices set by the Miami Parking Authority. And suppose you went to the convention center in Miami, maybe many of you have done that. Uh, the, uh, the, the Austrian garage cost 
seven dollars a dollar, a dollar an hour all on the street. So you could save five dollars and seventy-five cents if you could get a curb space. And suppose it just took you six minutes. That's a tenth of an hour. Uh, you'd be earning money at a rate of fifty-seven dollars an hour. That's what the city is paying you to drive around coming for a curb space. Those are the prices set by the city. Um, so it's really um, uh, wanting you to curb right, <laughs> to, to curb parking. It looks like um, we're all tempted to curb. And um, uh, there is an aerial view of where I was uh, speaking there, but plenty of off street parking you had to pay for. It. Um, but if you didn't want to pay, you could cruise for parking. Now, people have been doing studies of this. This is not a new idea. Uh, the first study of cruising was done appropriately in Detroit in 1927, uh, where they uh, uh, examined the license plate numbers passing each intersection and looked at the cars that kept reappearing over and over again. And they estimated, I think, that uh, in two different locations, uh, about 19% uh, and 34% of the cars were, were hunting for parking. And when you look at all of the studies done on four continents over about uh, 90 years, uh, the, uh, when they looked at congested traffic where the, all the curb spaces are full, they estimated about a third of the traffic was cruising. It took about seven minutes to find the uh, 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 curb parking space. Here's a, uh, uh, a nice graphic done, a uh, 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 study of Chicago before World War II. Um, and they stationed students at every intersection with uh, very accurate watches. Um, um, they, uh, no the license plate in every car that passed, and whether it went the time it passed, or whether it went straight ahead or left or right, so they could recreate the path of travel. And some cars were obsessed with parking a single block, but others were open to new experiences. They would try different things, talk to each other on a different block. And, and I, we've all done it. Uh, 
Um, so I think uh, a shift to my second policy, I think to make this popular, uh, I recommend the policy of parking benefit districts. So you can see the signs that are all meters in, in the Pasadena. The, the meter money makes a difference here in Pasadena. And most of us think that when we pay for parking, the money won't do anybody any good. It's probably used for a bad purpose, you know, to pay for uh, two large pensions for, for public employees or the Iraq war or something like that. And it has no money on the other side of the meter saying, yes, I want to charge for parking. But here's a picture of uh, around the, uh, uh, what happens during the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles at the Coliseum. But this happens in any event of the Coliseum because the residents of the nearby neighborhoods park their cars on the street and they sell their driveway space to, uh, uh, to the ticket holders. And they often have regular customers who always park in the same driveway. That uh, uh, the, the, when the Residents get the money. They understand the idea of charging for parking. They want to do it. Some people think that charging for curb parking is un-American. Well, I think it's a very American idea to charge users for what they use. Um, uh, we didn't become a great nation by being a bunch of freeloaders. But when it comes to parking, we want to be freeloaders. Uh, Nobody wants to pay for parking, including me, but that doesn't mean we should turn it into a principle of transportation planning and public finance. We had better our cities out of shape by trying to make parking free. And whenever I vote for something or protest against something so that I can park free, unintentionally I end up probably paying for parking for everybody else. And I think that the, the, the very worst thing about paying for my parking is paying for somebody else's parking. I don't want to go through life paying for everybody else's parking. Well, uh, Pasadena was one of the first cities that, that tried out this idea of uh, dedicating the meter revenue to create a political support for the meters. Uh, it was a, uh, a commercial skid row uh, uh, back in the, for many years. It, it, it was a, a they had beautiful buildings, wonderful buildings, in terrible condition. It was in its heyday of the 1920s, one of the, the finest shopping areas of one of the richest cities on the West Coast. And it didn't have much off-street parking, hardly any. Um, and came the Depression and World War II, and then the movement to the suburbs, it slowly decayed. People thought it would never recover. Here's what it looks like now. Um, it's one of the most popular